Stephen Weiss, thank you so much for joining me on Office Hours. Thank you for having me. So I'm so excited to have you here. You've been fighting for animal rights for some 30 years now. Your organization, the Non-Human Rights Project, has a landmark case that's before the New York Court of Appeals. That's the highest court in the state. And the case involves an elephant named Tabby, who is currently at the Bronx Zoo. So we're going to talk about all that. But before we get to it, I want to set the scene here. Tell us. What is the current state of animal rights? Well, that can be a very short answer. The uh, present state is that non-human animals don't have any legal rights in the United States. And what we're trying to do is is begin the process of non-human animals slowly being able to get rights in the United States. So the law currently views animals as things. What is the rationale for that? Why doesn't the law distinguish between what we typically think of things like a bug or a lamp and clearly what are living, intelligent beings? Well, they have been, non-human animals have been legal things for more than 2,000 years. And we found that when uh, an entity uh, is has been a... Uh, a thing for, for hundreds or thousands of years, it's hard to change it. That's what happened with, with, with human beings. Uh, the the uh, Greeks called their slaves things, the Romans called their slaves things. At time, women were things or children were things. And uh, it wasn't until uh, the 19th and 20th century that all humans stopped being things and, st- and started becoming all of us becoming persons. And that's what we're trying to do is to begin for at least some non-human animals like elephants or chimpanzees or orcas, uh, begin the process of of moving them up from being things which they've always been to having at least some of them be be persons, which means if you are a person, it just means that you have the um, capacity or the capacity for legal rights. Doesn't mean you have any particular ones, but at least you finally have the capacity for them. So, a lot of the law hinges on actually whether an animal or sometimes other things like a ship or a river could be considered a person uh, for purposes of the law. But before we get to that, broadly speaking, people hear that there's animal protection laws, right? Uh, what do these animal welfare laws do, generally speaking? What kind of protections do they provide and what are the limitations? Oh, my. I mean, there's so, so many in, in, in each state, there's different kinds of uh, animal protection statutes. And it's because different people, different legislatures in different states have passed statutes. You know, uh, they, they all began with anti-cruelty statutes in the 19th century and moved into the 20th century. And now each state makes its own determination as to how they, they would like to have a non-human animal treated, um, you know, in their state, in, in what animal welfare or animal protection laws should apply to them, but the, it, it, they don't change the serious fact uh, that non-human animals are all seen as things and not persons, and now they're things who have certain kinds of protections, uh, and some of them will say you can't be cruel to them, some of them are criminal, most of them uh, are, are not, and then if something happens to you, then someone can go to uh, you know, the attorney general of your state or the police and, and make a complaint. And the police or the attorney general can decide whether he or she wishes to do it. If they, if they don't, then nothing happens. There are many times when I tried to go to, to the uh, police or someone like that and say, this person, this non-human animal is, is being treated so that her, her criminal uh, that 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 a, a criminal action is being is being used that that's causing her an enormous amount of pain, and I haven't been able to get them to do anything. So you had mentioned earlier that in the fight to win certain rights for animals, we're going to start with certain kinds of animals. And right now, your organization, the Non Human Rights Project, represents apes, elephants, dolphins, and whales who are living in captivity in the U.S. So why these animals in particular? Well, they have all been the object of a great, great amount of scientific study, because uh, what underlies the work we do is is scientific study, scientific tests, scientists themselves 
we, whenever we file a lawsuit, there'll be a number, usually five, six, seven, even eight uh, world's experts uh, in, in, in the science of our non-human non animal client. And uh, there's not a whole lot of animals, non-human non animals who have been very carefully studied for as, as many years, for example, as a chimpanzee has. Um, and then we speak to those who have been able to um, understand what sort of beings those species are. And that's why we've spoken to a lot of people, uh, experts who have studied um, chimpanzees so hard or uh, elephants so hard, same thing for, for, for orcas. And they can then uh, come in and testify or, or bring in affidavits that, that testify as to you know, what they know. So for example, when we filed our, for our first uh, lawsuits on behalf of chimpanzees, there were somewhere between 400 and 500 um, uh, chimpanzee scientific articles that that the uh, that our our experts brought to the attention of the court. So that's that means that the judge can understand what a lot of the facts are, and uh, I think elephants uh, probably have fewer of them, but they still have enough. And so we're interested then in in, um, in presenting uh, the fact that our non-human animal clients, you know, are actually a lot like human beings. So that's why we, we bring arguments uh, both as a matter of liberty, but also a matter of, of equality. So what are some of the examples of these characteristics that the scientists pointed to say uh, this animal is in fact much closer to humans than for example, another animal? Ah, you know what, 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 I, what I could do is I could uh, even just uh, show you uh, what what one of the judges did, who was very much in favor of chimpanzees. So at one point, he said that the answer to the question of whether a non-human animal like a chimpanzee you know, should ever have a legal right, it depends upon, he says, our assessment of the intrinsic nature of chimpanzees as a species. And they have to be something that that he values. And he says that, that what we've done is we brought the uh, form of affidavits from primatologists and showing that they had advanced cognitive abilities, including, and these are the ones he said, he said, they can remember the past, they can plan for the future, they have the capacities of self-awareness and self-control, they have the ability to communicate through sign language, they make tools to uh, catch insects, they recognize themselves in mirrors, photographs and, and on television, they imitate others, they exhibit compassion and depression, they display this, they display a sense of humor, they're these extraordinary beings, and that's probably only about ten of them. We we listed, I'm sure, you know, thirty or forty or fifty of them. And some of them said also that, for example, chimpanzees are autonomous beings. So they 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 are autonomous, and they have they can self initiate intentional and what they call adequate adequately informed actions that are free of controlling inferences. In other words, they're a lot like us. That's that's incredible. So. Uh, these scientists, when uh, they provide this uh, expert testimony, they're speaking about the species, right? The chimpanzees or an elephant. Yeah. How do you choose which chimpanzee or which elephant your organization is going to represent? Well, it took us a lot of years. It took us actually seven years of looking at virtually every place that we could find where where, where uh, judges spoke English. So when you when you uh, pick the UK, for example, you just have the UK. But when you pick the United States, it means you have 50 states in Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. It took us a lot of years to, to go through all 53, 54 different places within the United States and then try to understand how were, were those uh, non-human animals, how were they treated in each of the 53 places, including also India and Australia and Pakistan and, and UK. It took a long, long time. And then, of course, um, if, if we care about chimpanzees or we care about elephants, then we have to find states in which they have them, because I, we're not, I'm not exactly sure how many states uh, all do have all uh, chimpanzees and then or elephants. And the ones who do, how are they being kept? Um, for example, you might have the Tennessee Elephant Sanctuary, which, which will keep a rel maybe, what, 10 elephants, but in like 2,600 incredibly beautiful acres. Same with, with paws out in uh, California and a 
newer one by Carol Buckley in, in Georgia. And you know, that's way different than say, uh, we're gonna send you to a place like, for example, the, the, the Bronx Zoo we're suing, where you end up having uh, one chimpan one elephant have to live in a half an acre to an acre, you know, for more than 40 years. That's, that's kind of hell on earth for an elephant. And they put her through that, you know, every day of her life. So let's talk about this elephant. Um, her name is Happy. Yes. Uh, she's uh, 50 years old, I believe. Yes. She's how, 50. How, tell us about her. How, how did she end up at Bronx Zoo? Uh, what are her living conditions and what relief specifically are you seeking in her case? Oh, well, she was kidnapped uh, as a baby from, from her family in, in Southeast Asia and, I, and was taken, I can't remember the, the names of the, of the specific places for a year or two years and then went to the Bronx Zoo. And that's where she's been now for more than 45 years. Um, it's a hellish place for an elephant. You know, I've been to Kenya. I've studied elephants. I, you know, there are all kinds of experts that, that we have. Uh, you know, we, we understand elephants and uh, the folks at the zoo don't understand elephants uh they they generally have never been to kenya they've never studied elephants they they, they just don't very, know very much about them so what and, are they not understanding well for example they don't understand what an elephant is so when you're like happy what you do is you're in a usually a half acre sometimes a whole acre of land they spend their life remember how big elephants are that they'll spend and and they'll spend a whole life in an acre of land that's nothing like it would it, it would be if they if if you're in Africa for example or, or Asia there's just aren't the same the same sort of worlds and generally if you're an elephant who's out in the wild oftentimes you you will move around uh, you know perhaps 20 miles a day and also especially if if you're a female as um, as happy is um, you might you you know you have a mother you'll have daughters you'll have sisters. And and you you love each other. You move around with each other. You you live this life of having you know 20, 30, 40 of them, and they live very different lives. And when you are a single elephant who's on a half acre land, when even if you're in a sanctuary, you'd be on twenty six hundred acres of land where there'd be rivers and you'd have friends. You know. What is the scientific consensus about elephants and their cognitive abilities? Well, they're, they're extraordinary, co extraordinarily cognitively complex beings uh, who, have a, who have this incredible, uh, incredibly complex social relationship, their individual relationship. They're very intelligent. They can communicate with each other, and they do sometimes when they're miles away. That was something that it took some of the elephant experts uh, a long time because they could see that sometimes elephants would be communicating with them, and when they'd be three or five or 10 miles away, and... Uh, I talked to one one of the famous ones yet, and he finally decided that may, maybe they were just reading each other's minds. He had no way of knowing how could they how could they know what, what each one was doing ten miles away from each other. And what they eventually found out is that they operate on such a very low voice that's beyond the ability of a human to hear them. You know, one thing that's struck me always about elephants is their ability to grieve. Uh, Yes. It's it's really shows you how close they are to human beings. Well, you you know it's 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 something that we can understand, but also think about what kind of mind they must have to be able to grieve. That means they they can love someone or something exactly. matters to them. Uh you know, they can wish the world was not as was not different now. Uh, you know, for example, you know, if you if you're talking to your three year old children, they're not grieving too much. You know, it, it takes humans a while to be able to grieve, and the, the you know the the elephants are way past that. You know, they're they can deeply grieve, and uh, but they can deeply do so many things. In 2005, uh, Happy made history, right? Uh, she passed the mirror self recognition test. Yes. How does that experiment work? Well, what they do in mirror self-recognitions, which, by the way, first used with chimpanzees, is that they, uh, and now they're, believe it or not, they're mostly used by human children. Uh, they're, they're used to test human children, and they're more, they're more, they're more, more human children used than all the non-human animals in the, in, in, in the world. And what, what you do, and how it, it was invented, for example, with chimpanzees, 
uh, is that uh, they were taught to look into a mirror. And, and uh, so they could look at the mirror, but, but the question is when, when you or I or my dog or an elephant, you know, looks into a mirror, they see, I, you know, I would see me, you would see you, an elephant would see the elephant, the, a dog would see a dog, but do they imagine that they're looking at themselves? And that's, and so what happened, what they did with chimpanzees is that they um, put them under anesthesia and then they would put um, red dots, like a red dot on their face or a red dot on their head. And then when they woke up, they would show them their, their uh, mirror. And the question was, would they think that they were looking at another chimpanzee with, with red dots or were they looking at themselves? And so they would use their hands and they would touch the green, the, the red dots they, on there, but they would also understand when they were touching themselves, they were watching that happen. So they knew that that was the dots that was on themselves. So far, um, I mean, it's, it's not easy because you have to figure out how that works. It's, it, but it's worked now with elephants. It's worked now with chimpanzees. Um, I believe that I just read last week that it was beginning to work with crows. Um, I have read, I have several books here about crows. You know, 10, 15 years ago, I started reading about them. Uh, and I just, I just couldn't believe it, how extraordinary cognitively complex, you know, crows are. So interesting. So let's talk about uh, this case. Uh, the great historian, Jill Lepore, writing in the Atlantic Magazine, called yeah. it, quote, the most important animal rights case of the 21st century. Do you agree with that assessment? I do. I didn't tell her that. I, that was hers. Uh, and, and I had never thought of that before. And I thought, well, yes, I think it is. Um, let me tell you what, what we do. Um, you know, right behind me, if, if you can see any, any of the books behind me, there's 150 books of the story of human slavery and litigation involving it and how it began and how it ended. And, you know, beginning with the, with the Greeks and the Romans and then in, in the Renaissance times, Middle Ages time, you know, and then going through the horrible thing that's going on in England and France and, uh, you know, throughout the United States. So, uh, so what, what, we, what we saw with slavery, for example, it was very, very difficult for slaves to stop being slaves. And uh, it was, it was uh, especially in the United States, but in other places too. There was one, by the way, that was relatively easy. In fact, I wrote a book about it. Uh, and it was about a, a case by James Somerset, uh, who was a slave who then escaped. And there was actually, uh, in 1771, 1772 in England, there was actually the first fight as to whether or not you could, you know, a black man could be a slave in England. The answer was for the very first time after seven months of a litigation, which was extraordinary because usually they, they lasted only an hour. And on June 22nd, 1772, Lord Mansfield said that, that they, were, you know, they weren't slaves. He wasn't, he wasn't a slave anymore. And um, uh, you know, having them understand, understand who the slaves are is so important. And that's why it's so important for us. We spend so much time trying to get judges to understand who, the, who they are, who they are. And so then that's that issue. Then there's the other issue, which is that most people have never thought about that. They're, they're, we're, we're, we're just kind of biased against it, just like we were biased against slaves, we were biased against women. Uh, and now we're, we're, you know, they all have rights and now people are still biased at, at non-human animals. And so you have to figure out uh, what are you going to do when you go in front of judges who have never thought of this problem? Um, you know, m most of them, like when we, I guess we began in 2013, we're now in the eighth year. May I say that the first years we went in, well, I'd say some of the judges were nice. Some of them obviously could not stand us or thought we were just wasting everybody's time. And, uh, and we understood that that was going to happen. What I'd read about slavery told me that, that that's what, how it's going to happen. And so, we figured the first thing we're going to have to do is just go into court and begin to educate judges who've never heard about it. And then what we do is that we'd hope we'd be able to run into judges. And, and we began to do that after three or four years. We began to run to judges who showed that they were sympathetic to us. And, and one of the things that occurred is that we, we'd go in and try to get hearings on, on habeas corpus for, a, say, a chimpanzee. And the judges, sometimes, most of the time, would not even hear us. We'd have zero minutes, sometimes 15 minutes, occasionally half an hour. 
But in Happy's case, for the first time, we were in front of a judge who allowed us to argue for 13 hours over three days. And that totally persuaded her. The other side would, you know, was there, the Bronx Zoo, but they had no experts, not even the experts who they hire as part of the Wildlife Conservation Society, which owns the Bronx Zoo. They didn't bring any of their experts in. They didn't hire them. You know why? Because the best experts in the world were hired by us to come in to say that they shouldn't have happy and, and she should have a right to be, to be let go. And so after 13 hours of that, of that argument, the judge understood it. And she wrote an opinion that, that said, re, quote, regrettably, unquote, I have to rule against you because of a higher court, but I think you're right. And then she explained why? Because of, of who the experts were, because who the elephants are, how extraordinary they are, that they should be able to be free. They should be able to have liberty. And so that then we said, great. So that then brings us up. We had tried four times to go to the Court of Appeals of New York, four times over eight years. The first two times they had said no. And again, they said no. <laughs> and then the third time they said no. But this time, for perhaps what we're hearing for the first time is that that one of the judges kind of broke off and he said, I think that we should be looking at chimpanzees and I suspect that they might be entitled to a legal right. His arguments were terrific. And so when we brought, when we had our 13 hour case and then we went up to another appellate court above them who thought our, our argument was stupid and they, they wrote a one paragraph opinion saying, get out of here, this is stupid. We went up to the fourth time and said, judge, we want you to hear our case. And they said, yes, on May 4th, 2021. That's the next step we wanted. Obviously, we can't get the highest court in a state to agree with us unless the highest court will take the case. Now, so we're, we've already gone through three or four of the top five or six things that, that we need to do. Now we're going to go in front of them and we get to argue in front of them. And it's the first time that, in, in, that the judges of the highest English speaking court in a jurisdiction has ever agreed to hear this kind of an argument with respect to a non-human animal. So these cases, in this case, uh, hinges on this idea of personhood, whether this yes. animal, say elephant like Cappy, is considered a person for legal purposes. What have courts said about what constitutes uh, a person and how would you define it if uh, you were a judge? I mean, if you're not a person, a you're a thing. You only have two, two choices. You're either a thing, which means you do not have the capacity for rights, or you're a person, which means that you do. Now, by the way, this is something that the other side tries to fool the judges on, but we try to make sure that doesn't happen. When you stop being a thing and become a person, what that means is that you have the capacity for a million rights, but you also, or, or one, or zero. So it's possible, for example, for a non-human animal to be a person, which means they have the capacity for rights. But maybe we would bring the first case in and a, a judge would say, yes, this elephant's a person, but the specific right that you want, we're not going to give to you. So that then we would say, okay, well, maybe we bring another lawsuit saying, well, maybe she's entitled to this, to this right or, or this right, but at least she'd be able to be entitled to rights. And that's really important for us to be able to listen to them um, or, or listen to the courts and then uh, try to um, try to make the arguments that they will accept that are important enough to change anything to a, to a, to a person who should at least have some right that will protect you know their their most fundamental things that they're made out of you know in, in the world one of the courts that uh, heard uh, some of your cases said uh, in order to be considered the person for legal purposes, you have to have the capacity to bear legal rights and duties. That that's yeah. necessary for person. Yes, uh, we, you've argued that's that's yes, that's wrong. Uh, why is that wrong? It was it was the third department of the New York Appellate Courts who ruled that it said uh, our chimpanzees were not uh, allowed to have um, rights. Because, the, because in order to have rights, you have to be able to have the capacity for duties, you know, and for rights. But you all, and, uh, and chimpanzees didn't have the capacity to, to obey, to have human duties or, or to have duties. 
And, and we argued to them and we said, you know, everywhere you go, every single you know, case and book would say, you have to be able to have the capacity for rights or duties. Now, you, once you have a right, you, have the, you can have the capacity for both. But if you took one of them away, you would still have the capacity for one of them. And all you need is one of them in order to have a right. One strange thing happened for the third department, um, which is they also cited a book called the Black's Law Dictionary, which is what lawyers all over the United States use to see you know, what a, what a uh, definition means. And the dictionary said just what they said, which you had to have it, um, you had to have the capacity for rights and duties. And we said, we were scratching our heads saying, that can't be. It just can't be. But they, they had um, cited an, uh, like a 50-year-old uh, Black's Law dictionary. It took us months to find one. And we found one finally in the Library of Congress. We opened it, opened it up and found out that it actually said rights or duties and not rights and duties. So we then, we then uh, emailed the, uh, the publisher and we said, you, you got it wrong. You made a quote from someone who said, or, and you saw it as and, and we're losing cases because of you, because you got the, he got it wrong and he apologized. And the next time Black, Black um, Law Dictionary came out, he changed it to say that you didn't have to be, to be a human being. But by that time, we had already lost the case and other, other courts would, would cite it. And we'd say, would you stop doing this and read Blacks and listen to what we're, what, what we're doing? But what, for example, we even once, I guess we've done it more than once, we actually file a motion saying, here's the publisher who said how he was wrong and he's changed it. And would you please change your, your mind? And they say, no. They say, that's what the court did based upon this. And we say, but they got it wrong because the dictionary got it wrong. It is, so we were hoping that the, the, that the New York Court of Appeals will actually pay attention to what we're doing this time and, and not feel that the requirement itself is something our elephant can't meet. We happen to believe, by the way, our elephant can, can have both duties uh, and rights, and so can a chimpanzee. But we're not gonna ta- we don't have to prove that. We just have to prove that they can have the capacity for rights. And they do. They're so smart. They do. As you mentioned uh, several times, you you file these habeas corpus petitions on behalf of these animals. Yes. Some people say uh, that to file a habeas petition for an animal, it's demeaning to the human beings uh, who seek this relief. What is your reaction to that argument? Well, say if you're severely mentally ill or if you're a child, you have no idea what, what, what habeas corpus is. You know, one, one of the things I've studied, so some of the books behind me are, for example, and you'd have the 1830s, 1840s, where you might have a four or five-year-old black child who's been brought into from a slave state into a non-slave state. And then they bring a writ of habeas corpus on, on his behalf. He has no idea what's going on. He doesn't know what a law, a lawyer is or a court or, or a writ of habeas corpus, but they believe that he should be free. And so they bring the habeas corpus and the judge orders the the child free. Um, There's a case in New York, for example, where um, uh, an elderly father has like Alzheimer's. And so uh, he lives with his daughter in in one apartment in New York City and his his wife lives in another without him. And she wants him. She wants her husband. And so she actually brings a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of him. She wants to be the one to care for him. And she won. The father had no idea where he was or where he was going or what habeas corpus was or even who he was. But the, but the, the judge said, yes, you may have him. And so she was able, then able to move him from living in, uh, in uh, his daughter's uh, room. He didn't even know it, brought over to his wife who then was able to, to, to take care of him. So it has nothing to do to being able to understand it. Um, if, if you don't understand it, then a third party can. That's one of the beauties of a, a habeas corpus is that you, it's one of the very few causes of action where you can have a third party uh, has automatic standing. In other words, we're allowed to do that. So we've understood, you know, every single time we brought a, uh, a case in um, New York, uh, the eight times we have, we always knew that they were not going to throw us out for lack of standing because that's the history of habeas corpus. And of course, there was, there was no standing requirement in, in the Somerset case in 1772. He wouldn't have been able to bring his own case because he was, he was a black slave. But, uh, but 
oh, but white people did. And they were able to bring his case and the judge was then able to find that he was indeed a person. So if Happy wins this case, um, does that mean the end of all elephant exhibits in the US? No, it means that Happy leaves the uh, Bronx Zoo and goes to a sanctuary. And that's all it means. And when people argue that, you know, the ruling would be extended to other and uh, elephants who are at zoos, you say? Well, certainly, um, if Happy was said to be a person who had a right to bother liberty and we can move her into a sanctuary, at that point, we would then immediately approach all the places in New York that have elephants and say, would you please move them to a sanctuary because the place where you have them, unless for some reason, their place is as good as the sanctuary, but they're not. There aren't any places in North America who are. And so uh, so we, we would do that. And if they did not agree, then we would bring a, a habeas corpus lawsuit against them. Of course, once we step out to any other of the 49 states, their law is not New York's law, and you'd have, we'd have to start all over again. People um, who sort of see the extension of Happy's Freedom across the board uh, to all the elephants kept at Zeus say that if people can't see animals at Zeus and interact with them, they'll be more likely to be less empathetic and less likely to become conservationists. And they worry that it will sort of create a distance between humans and elephants and will care less about elephants. What do you make of this argument? Well, it's kind of um, insane. I, 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 I don't even grasp what, what they're talking about. Yeah, and so we're supposed to keep them in a way that makes them utterly miserable and terrible slaves, and somehow seeing an utterly miserable, terrible being, that's supposed to make us feel good about conservation or make them make us feel good about anything, what we should do is say, oh my God, it's like this, this being is being terribly brutalized his whole life. And so when you go to a, uh, a zoo, you're not looking at anything you would see if you went into a, uh, a natural wild elephant. I mean, under that theory, say there's some really interesting human being out there. We'll say, oh, you know, I think people should see that person. I know what we'll do. We'll put her in jail and, or we'll put her outside in a zoo and we'll let people go by and say, gee, I really, she's having a great life. And she's sitting there you know, in, in a zoo. By the way, the, the uh, Bronx Zoo has a horrendous history in 1906 of bringing in a black pygmy and putting them in a cage in the primate house in order to make money uh, until they were forced to, forced to stop. So they have a history of being biased bigots in 1906 against blacks, and now they're a biased bigot against elephants. It's the same place. So Bronx Zoo has made you know, a bunch of arguments about why they shouldn't release Happy among them. She's too old, she doesn't get along with other animals. We've taken care of her for 40 years. We know what's better for her. She Hold on. I want to be better off. I'm trying not to laugh. Hold on. I'm just, <laughs> I have to keep myself. Okay. Okay. Go on. My question is, uh, what, what do you think is motivating Bronx Zoo to fight you so hard on this? Is it, is it greed essentially? Is it wanting to make money off of uh, the ticket prices or what is? It? Yes, there. It, it's money in some way. Um, you you cannot believe you you cannot believe the the uh, stuff we see. Um, there have been amicus briefs filed. Here's one from the National Association for Biomedical Research. They really want her treated that way. They they what? Why would the National Association for Biomedical Research you know care about about whether Happy stays there? Then we had oh my goodness they're. Um, we had the New York Farm Bureau wants happy to stay there. They have the, the Protect the Harvest, the Alliance, the Alliance of Marine Mammal Parks and Aquariums, the Animal Agricultural Alliance, the Feline Conservation Foundation, the, uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association. Oh, they have at least one more. And you're saying none of these 
and the, the, these these organizations basically many of them are not 501c3 which is which means that they're nonprofit they're there like the American Veterinary Medical Association National Association of Biomedical Research they're 50136 and so in other words they're they're they it's a business their purpose is to make money and so people hire them to, to pay to stop statutes being passed that'll help them or to spend, to hire lawyers to try to uh, keep them from being able to make money from uh, abusing and taking advantage of non-human animals. Um, also, the man, Brahini, who runs that, the, non, the uh, uh, Bronx Zoo, he was also on the board of directors making huge amounts of money. When I look, I have his tax here, like half a million dollars, that's what he's getting for that, it said. And uh, and in order for, for the American Zoological Association, what they get to, they want to be in charge of everything. They want people and organizations to join up with them as well. And that, that's how they make their money. It's all money. It has nothing to do with anything else. People who support your mission um, have nevertheless expressed concerns that the Wildlife Conservation Society, which owns the Bronx Zoo, is uh, spending a lot of money funding this case. And this is money that could go to uh, furthering their mission, which is in part to preserve um, the, the habitats of elephants living in the wild. Is that something you took into consideration? What does the cost benefit analysis yes. look like for you? Yes, if you have their tax form like I do, you'll find that they're worth, worth uh, $1.1 $1 billion. One point one billion dollars. I don't know how much they're 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 uh, paying their lawyer, but it's probably a millionth of a percent. I mean, they aren't paying them anything. I mean, it, and it, it doesn't cost them anything. What does it cost? Twenty five thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred. Even if it costs them a million dollars, what's one million of one point one billion dollars? They don't even notice that that it's gone. Uh, that's number one. Number two, from the very beginning, we offered to settle the case. Was, even though we're looking for the rights of non-human animals, we believe that our client, our non-human animal client, is our client. And we do will do things that hurt our attempt to gain rights if we can help our client. From the very, very moment that we began until this moment, if the Bronx Zoo came to us and said, we will give up happy and allow her to be moved to sanctuary, we would say it's a deal and we would not push any further. So any money that they spent is their choice to do it. They didn't have to. And the amount that they spent is incredibly small. It's like, like what, 10 cents for me or something like that. So ultimately your priority here is to help happy to win liberty for her and by reaching a settlement with Bronx Zoo, you would uh, forego potentially setting a huge precedent in this case. Yes, because if if we if we said we're we're going to make her stay there and see whether we win, she would she we we'd be taking as much advantage of Happy as they're taking advantage of her. They're taking advantage of her because all they want is money. What 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 we want to do is begin having judges talk about. Uh, whether a non-human animal can have a right, and we have, we have to bring a lawsuit. But th at that point, once we take that, we believe that you know we treat that that uh, being as if she was a human. And if we can help her, and we don't uh, end up having uh, getting the opportunity of, sh of proving that she uh, is a person, then we'll say fine. She's you know she's first, and then we would file another lawsuit of another another elephant somewhere uh, who um, uh, should be freed, just like happy. So in 2022, next year, uh, you have this oral argument yes. coming up before the Court of Appeals, as we said, highest court, uh, state court in New York. It's it's a huge deal. The court takes about 5% yes. of cases for Actually, review. I think, it's free. I think they take 3%. 3%. Wow. So yes. it's even more rare than I thought. Yes. How How are you preparing for this oral argument? What uh, points will you be placing emphasis on? What is the strategy here? What I've been talking to you about, what you know, the the cases that support what I'm saying. Every time that there's a case that I'm saying, uh, that there's something I'm saying, there are there are 
a line of cases that we say, you know, this is what the law is. We're saying what the law is now. We're not asking them to change it. We're, we're saying what the law is now. We will then you know, make arguments as long as we can on any of the issues. Uh, there's probably a hundred issues. In the half an hour I have to argue, there's probably going to be about six of them brought up. So I have to learn all 100 of them and be ready to go on any of them. And maybe one will come up that I wasn't expecting to. But that's all right. It's, uh, it's been 36 years since I've been getting ready for this case. And so I have hundreds and th or actually thousands of books on it. Um, I've taught at nine law schools, you know, at Harvard, at Stanford, in, in, uh, in Tel Aviv, in Barcelona, you know, all over, all over the United States. So I teach. I've written four books, 22 law review articles. We, we, we've been working so hard on for, for 20, more than 20 years on the Non-Human Rights Project. So the Bronx Zoo better watch out because you've been preparing for this oral argument most of your life. Well, I, I have. And, and, uh, uh, and they have probably done it for a year or, or two years. And plus, they don't spend all their time. That's all I do is, is that. Uh, and that's all all of the people in the Non-Human Rights Project do is they work uh, to uh, begin the process of gaining legal rights for non-human animals. And, you know, we, we, um, we, we uh, file our, our, our lawsuits here, but, you know, but, but we also, uh, I don't know if I, if I said, we're also filing, a, a, in fact, today, we're filing an amicus brief in Ecuador and, you know, and, and we've been working in Argentina and, you know, and other states because um, it's, it's so many of the arguments, you know, uh, the other countries all have different kinds of law, but we watch what happens some judges have said that this is an issue that's best suited for the legislative process. Um, what do you say to that? Why pursue the common law approach versus uh, lobbying the state legislatures and Congress to create rights for animals? Well, New York is a, is a uh, habeas corpus common law cause of action. So th this was this follows like like what Lord Mansfield in the Somerset case did in 1772. Three years later, uh, the uh, New York Court Constitution actually brought that case into into its law. So its law is the is is common law, and that that's what it is. And and the and the person who works on the common law are courts. And in fact, it's so extraordinary that the Constitution in, in New York will not allow a legislature to diminish anything that a that a, a court says uh, you're entitled to for for habeas corpus. So this is a, a habeas corpus is wholly solely a mandatory cause of action that anyone can bring on behalf of someone who is being imprisoned against their will. So. If the legislature wants to do really nicer things than a court does, they're allowed to do that, but they're not allowed to do not nicer things. And I don't think uh, most of the judges we went before really even understood that. By the way, if I can say one thing, um, um, the judge uh, uh, who, who uh, at, the, uh, at the Court of Appeals who voted in our, in our favor, the very last line of his, his case uh, was it said, while it may be arguable, while it may, it may be arguable, in other words, it's not, but it may be arguable that a chimpanzee is not a person. There's no doubt that is not merely a thing. Well, the way it goes, you're either a person or a thing. And if he says you're not merely a thing, then you as a person. As we wrap here, um, I want to come back to you personally. How yeah. did you get into this work? Why did you decide to make it your life's mission? Well, I was just a young lawyer at that time. Um, I know I look, I'm probably looking like I'm 35, but I'm actually a little older than that now. And so uh, uh, I was just practicing law, you know, my own, my own for five years. And I, someone handed me, a woman handed me this book called Animal Liberation by a philosopher named Peter Singer. I said, I read it and I was absolutely amazed by it and saw that how horrible we were abusing non-human animals. And then as a lawyer, young lawyers reading it, I, it didn't appear that they had any kind of lawyers on their side, that there were no laws that were protecting them. I decided that I was going to do that. And I started doing it at a very low level. Then I became a president of an organization now called the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Uh, and then at uh, nine, let's see, uh, from 1985 to 1995, then what I wanted to do was 
I really realized that the only way you truly get protected if you're a non-human animal is the only way you truly get protected if you are, uh, if you're a human being, which is that they needed to have rights. I began uh, reading about that and thinking. In 1985, I thought, it's going to take me 30 years of work to get to the point where we have any chance of being able to, to win. So that's why I began to, to uh, try to teach. And I ended up teaching at Harvard and Stanford and seven other law schools. I wrote four books. I wrote 22 law review articles. And I'd, I, I would give, give speeches. And slowly, 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 people began to pay more attention to me. And then, I, then I, in 1995, I began the Non-Human Rights Project and then began bringing other people in. And then even then, though, it still took us, um, uh, 1995, it took us uh, 28 years of work before we were able to file the first lawsuits for rights. And that was in New York in 2013 on behalf of four chimpanzees. If I tried to do this 10 years ago or, or earlier, no one would have cared. But uh, it, it just had to do a laydown of, of, uh, of books and, uh, and articles and teaching and have people come out and say, I think he, I don't think he's nuts. He's not nuts. He's right. He's right. And more and more people. And now, for example, uh, the number of people who have been involved with amicus briefs on our side, there've not been 70 people uh, who have signed amicus briefs. And I believe there are, there are lots more out there and uh, also organizations as well, or a bunch of philosophers or a bunch of scientists or a bunch of habeas corpus specialists. They filed amicus um, uh, amicus briefs uh, as well. Stephen Weiss, I'm wishing you the best of luck before the New York Court of Appeals and across all your efforts in America and internationally. Thank you so much for joining me on Office Hours. Thank you. And if you'd like, uh, you, you can come to Albany and sit in at the Court of Appeals while we have that fight whenever it happens. Oh, you bet I'll be there. <laughs>